Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of The Gentleman and the Scholar. I am John Welsh, and I am the gentleman. And I am Alex Stanford, and I am the scholar. <laughs> What's going on, buddy? What is going on, buddy? <laughs> Man, it, this is a good one. This is, I am, I was ex- super excited. Shit. You already started with us. Saw it early. I'm very excited for this show. As much as I was for the last show, I'm more excited for this show. Why? This is why. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Are you looking around right now? Look at this. We, we told have, you guys, we yes. told you guys that we had attracted the attention of the VIP Club Habano yes, and and they delivered. And so now we have more pieces on loan to set up our beautiful Habano studio. We have a Cuban made table. We have Cuban furniture. We have the list of the Cuban brands, and we have a bunch of uh, amazing antiques and collectibles from Cuba. And uh, eventually, we'll, we'll get a chance to talk to all you guys about it, but we're just very excited that we have these these beautiful works of art. We have this bowl of our ashtray. You can see this thing. This is pristine, and it's... I never thought I could be so enamored with cigar paraphernalia and yeah. I absolutely am I'm just absolutely blown away this is incredible I was actually floored by some of these pieces that were brought in for us too. like they had a cigar press there that they used in Cuba to roll these cigars and they, they I was I was told today about how they how the, the press works and all that stuff but that's all on we have cutters on them. we have stuff that you can never get again all along to us. I'm gonna, I'm, just... I'm gonna pause your geek. I'm gonna Kanye you here yeah. a little bit. <laughs> I wanna make sure I remind all of our viewers that if you haven't already done so, please like, like. comment, subscribe, hit the bell of notifications. Yeah, you, gotta, oh, you gotta keep up with us. We're doing stuff every week. We're gonna be putting out teasers and whatnot during the week. We need you with us on this ride. This is a magic carpet ride like nothing else. This is a magic tobacco ride. Yes, it and is. And I, I want everybody right there with us. And also, I need to give a big shout out to our official sponsor yes we do bailey's cigar shop it is in veterans on in karen crow it is our place to go hang out yes it's it got is. everything you need for your pipes for your cigars uh your humidors and it's got a lovely walk-in humidor tvs sofas they'll store your booze for you they have lockers i mean it's just what, guys the it, limits in there oh watching a football game you can forget about it because you're like forget about we're sitting here it. we're smoking stoves and we're being disappointed by a team <laughs> i'm talking about your team yeah, obviously my team. not my team my team's winning my team is very disappointing this year my team season 2020 uh, sorry, hashtag up, winning Eagle fans. hey hey you got a new quarterback yes we do wow how does it feel to have the most expensive quarterback sitting on the bench right now like poo like poo. It's super not good. I guess you say Carson Winston gone, huh? Super not good. <laughs> Pick up your glass, buddy. That's twice we got a drink. That's on you. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. I'm just gonna watch you. Yeah. Oh and hey, I hear the I hear the Eagles are playing the Saints this weekend. I guess they are. Wow. Are you excited for that one? No, I'm not. Because <laughs> it's gonna be like a railroad. <laughs> Man, I wonder if by the end of the game Jalen's gonna hurt. With the way Cam Jordan likes to get the quarterback, yeah. Trey Hendricks. Oh man, this, it's going to be it's going to be uh, it's going to be a prison game situation. It's going to oh, be nasty. Let's hope it's not. Let's also, speaking like- of subscribers, got to make sure we get to that thousand subscriber bench mark. Yes, we do. Because we, well, we got some things lined up. I'm, I'm a little excited. I'm gonna. I'm getting ahead of myself. Cause People, it only get be- it gets better from here. Like I mean, we're going up, up, up. Let we're gonna not, blow your mind. Let us not forget, ladies and gentlemen. We also have cigars to smoke. We haven't even gotten to those yet. Yeah. Well, they're coming. But I just want to say, now that we have an official studio, yeah. major announcement alert, boop, 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 we got guests coming. Okay. Oh, we have a lot and of I, guests. And I've, I've talked to you. i got several lined up already. We're just getting the details of who's going to come on and when. But Yeah, because on the first episode, we talked about that. We said, oh, we're going to bring somebody. And then we were like, wait, we got to make this perfect. You're... We, I like. I said it last week. We're from sea to shining sea. We have everyone, and I have to give a big shout out to a Frank in Maryland. Said that we wanted this. He was like, I, "We are in love with your show too." All the way coming from Maryland. Guess what, Frank? We love you too, buddy. Speaking of comments, I want to. I want to stress when we say 
comment on the show. It's not just because it feeds algorithms and it's good for the show, but we love reading them. We love answering Heck questions. Yeah. We love giving feedback. And we got a comment on our, our last episode about doing a like a cigar flight where we'll take five cigars. Yep. One of us will know what they are. The other one will not. And then the one who doesn't know what they are is going to have to do like a flight and smoke them all in yep. turn, not at the same time. It'd be like Zam feared the cigar flute. That would be really messed up. <laughs> but no, you, you get a chance to tam- sample them all, and then you get to rank them. Or whoever is the, 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 the tester is going to, going to rank them, and we're going to compare that ranking with Cigar Aficionado to see if you know what you're doing or if you're a, a lazy dog, you know. Well, my see. palate is, is I, I, I think I have a great palate for cigars. But you're kind of the person who I would I would lean to to do that. So I'm gonna, I'm going to push this one off on you. You're going to make me do it. Oh yeah, you're that's, doing. That's that's. But I want to be the secret guy going. Oh, let's see if he knows what he knows. That was off script. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> you scum. Okay, well you know that's fine. That's fine. I think it's time. Let's yes. talk about today's cigar. This is a good one, people. This is a, this is a good one. For a Connecticut, this one's really good. What we have are. There you go, man. We have JFR Connecticut's, and I know what you're thinking. Alex, you guys are hardcore cigar smokers. Why are you bringing another Connecticut on? You already did your intro episode where you featured a Connecticut. Why would you have another one? Well, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. We talked with Gary, our friend over at Bailey's, and, and he gave me a couple suggestions, and this was one of them. And he said, what I like about this one is that while it is a Connecticut, it is really a Connecticut in name only. It is a very full flavored Connecticut where you're going to get more flavor than you would, but to still have the lightness of a Connecticut. And so it's kind of like a, a best of both worlds. You're almost cheating with, with the value to give. And there are a couple other features that I think warrant discussion. Yeah. Hence, we are discussing them. If you pull the rice paper sleeve off, you can see that the foot of the cigar is still overgrown with leaf, okay? That is to look unmanicured, like it just came off the press line. And then on the other end, on the cap, you have what's called a pigtail knot. And a pigtail, what's what's interesting about these is that a lot of the Habanos from Cuba have these little pigtail caps and they serve a purpose because if you need to smoke one and you don't have a cutter, you can actually tear the pigtail off and that will aspirate that'll put a hole in the cap allowing you to draw and you can smoke it that way so it's a little bit different than it's kind of almost like a niche connecticut yeah. and i've had these before and i have to say that out of connecticut i, I liked it I, I i thought that um it was a deceptively good value because you know what these cost seven dollars and fifty cents that's a bargain seven dollars and fifty cents i mean that's that's like a pack of cigarettes and, yeah. and, and this will make you friends. No, cigarettes aren't going to make you any friends unless yeah, you're no. trying to give them away to high school kids and you're just a loser and you shouldn't be watching our show. <laughs> you should be talking to Chris Hansen somewhere you know, <laughs> in the house. So this, it's a good deal. And the uh, piece of trivia, the JFR on the band stands for just for retail. Yep. Which is neat. So let's go ahead and do our pre-light inspection, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I've been doing mine, and this is a, uh, I mean, it's its a nice, I, the oils are really coming through on mine. I will say this, that the wrapper is impressive, because I've looked yeah, at some nice. wrappers uh, today, actually, where they were very veiny. Uh, I, I had a Villiger the other day, and I noticed the wrapper had like, like a crease in it, where the, they were folding it, and it kind of got gnarled up. And I'm thinking, why would you why would you market that? Why would that make it through inspection and you sell that to the public? That that just yeah. looks like garbage. And that was a much more expensive smoke than this JFR. So the wrapper looks looks good. I kind of dig the uh, the over over wrap on the uh, the foot because it I like I mean, it's extra it's extra wrapper. Yeah, which is the most flavorful tobacco on the uh, cigar. All right, let's see what kind of dry pull we have here. Didn't right. mind that. I- Feels like my wrapper is slightly desiccated. It's a little bit dry. Yeah. I'm getting a little bit of a little bit a little bit of hay on my, my yeah. dry pull. With a very, very subtle spice, very subtle pepper on the finish. You never know when, when a cigar is gonna give you the pepper on the dry draw when it's not. And then and then a lot of times when you get one on the dry, then you light it, it's gone. 
on the first third, which is just very, it's almost like a thermos. It keeps warm stuff warm, keeps cold stuff cold. How, how does it know? It's just- How do you know? It's like psychic. <laughs> All right, let's light this bad boy. Here we go, getting a big plume off of my over wrap here and it's falling on my paper. It's fine. <laughs> It's and good. we're going to burn down our new set. We are now evacuating because the fire department is en route. Love it. Right off the bat, I'm getting caramel. Oh, yeah? A little bit of caramel, oh, yeah. I'm so ready to dig in. I'm sure our viewers are like, that guy's weird. There's no way. He's How's it, how, how is this guy like? I looked at it, and it's got notes of vanilla and chicory. <laughs> no, but serious. It's got a lovely, lovely caramel, mm. a little finish to it. Very subtle. This is hard to believe that this is a Connecticut, right? It's such an insignificant steak, but yeah, like, but is... it makes a good cigar. <laughs> it's crazy. That was dumb. I just got it. I <laughs> just got well, it. Well, that just took me a second. And listen, I'm sorry. I was out drinking last night. And today. And today. And tomorrow and the next day. No. Well, it's starting the weekend, you know, so. Yeah. It's fine. It's okay. I, I hope that the viewers have had a chance to go and get some of these, to smoke these with us, because I would love to have people putting in the comments that they're oh, yeah, picking up on the same it. notes. Or at least that you guys are full of garbage. You know, yeah. you're making this up. There's no way. I'm not tasting Ooh, forest pepper, honey in this or whatever. Back in it. You can really get that pepper in the back in it. See if you guys pick it up. If you guys pick it up, let us know in the comments. T tell me this. is. Uh, I'm Gentlemen, John, if you were blindfolded uh -huh. and they asked you to smoke this, would you guess it was a Connecticut? No. Just off the flavor? I don't think I would either. No. I, I think would. I might even go more sun grown. Yes. That's where I would go. Yeah. I would never say it was because you're a smart guy. <laughs> you're just a <laughs> smart guy. That's why you would go there. <laughs> oh, my God. Where are we at? Oh. Uh, The pepper in the back end is it's killing. It's subtle. It's a subtle pepper. It's not overpowering. Yeah. Like I, I had a tabernacle the other day. I, I, had, I had been lucky enough to get my hands on a Cohiba especialis, which uh, is 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 not easy <laughs> it's to the best ones. Is not easy to come by. Okay. Yeah. No. And it was it was it was delicious. As Martha Stewart would say, it's a good thing. It was lovely. And then I wanted more as one is wont to do when smoking stuff like that. But I didn't have any more. So I went and grabbed a Tabernacle Broadleaf, which is a very fine smoke. That was one of my favorites. And the pepper contrasts, because there's like no pepper in Habanos. And then the pepper from this Tabernacle, which is a peppery cigar, yeah. I, I almost couldn't do it. I was like, holy shnikes, I need a glass of milk. This is intense. But fortunately, it tapered off after the first start, so it got, it got okay. But man, that adjustment period, I was like watering my eyes. It was, uh, it was almost masochistic. But That's I did. crazy. But it was good, though. Man, it, it, this is a... Uh... This is some crazy times we're, st we're living dude, in right now. Dude, so speaking of crazy times, have you seen that not only has Texas sued those four swing states, it was uh, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, yeah. for their their illegal, unconstitutional election procedures. That's really what the, the nexus of the, 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 tr the crux of the lawsuit is about. But something like 20 other states have joined in so we're almost at 50 50 with the country it's like half the yeah, country is like no 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 we we're cool with it we because we want biden and the other half is like no 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 you guys cheated we, we want trump and where's it gonna go yeah where's it what are we gonna do uh, my, my, the people that i talk to they're telling me about the flyover traffic with helicopters and airplanes and apparently like china's mobilizing some forces and so it's like I, I don't know, but we need a gun sponsor because I need to plug guns <laughs> like now. I need to yeah, be able to tell people like, out, you need to go to your local corner, street corner and see Vincent and get some guns, you know, because yes. people get get guns. If, get if something. To if you sell family. guns and you like cigars, sponsor us and then we will we will promote you. John will plug yes. you. I'll, I'm not going to plug anybody, I'm, but I'll tell them about you <laughs> because uh, listen, with with our nation getting so divided and then on top of that 
you know, you everyone keeps saying like, oh, that's they, they just lied. The media is kicking you one way, social media is kicking you another way, and then you have these truth tellers that are like the Guardian that's out there, which is a newspaper. Uh, that's they say, look, we don't, we're not, we're not left, we're not right, we're right down the middle, and we just give you the facts, and you guys make up your mind. That's kind of like their stiff or whatever. That's what that's what they say. When yeah. when it, when it's a story that they like, then their attitude is, we just want you to make up your mind. Like when the Trump dossier was released, yeah. and there was this ridiculous, unverified information about Trump and Russian hookers and golden showers. BuzzFeed was just like, here you go. And the public was like, that seems a little unvetted. Maybe you should do what you do. And, the, and, their, and their response was, well, we just think this is good information and we're not saying it's true. We just think the public has a right to hear it and then make up their own mind. And you're like, well, if I don't think about it, that kind of sounds like a good idea. Yeah, well, I mean, we should be able to make up our own minds. Yet when stuff comes out about Hunter Biden or the Bidens, then the media is like, that's unverified and we're not going to be a party to gossip. We're better than that. We have journalistic standards and stuff. It's like, oh, wow, that's really funny how... Uh... Being a person who's from Delaware and the people who I know had the laptop, sorry, it's, it's verified. Like you can't not verify because the people Delaware is super small, especially around the Wilmington area. Like, it's, isn't Joe Biden from Delaware? He's not from. He's actually from Pennsylvania, but he's his home state. He claims is Delaware. So you're not related to him. I know it's a small state. No, hell. Okay, okay. all right. No, I was my, like, this friendship's brother, over. No, my <laughs> my brother did some work for him. Uh, uh, his son or whatever, uh, the one who passed away. You know, rest in peace. You know, uh, but no, it's a. Uh, um, it's 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 sad that they they'll they'll overlook something. It's like people who believe in the Bible. You go, oh, well, you can't cherry pick what's right for you. If you're gonna be a Bible thumper, then you're gonna be a Bible thumper. If you're not, then you know you shouldn't be practicing your religion. At all. Did you know that that Joe Biden's son Hunter was in the military? Briefly. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know what he did in the military? What? Crack shot. <laughs> So messed up. <laughs> I just made that up. I was like, ah, I gotta make a crack joke about Hunter Biden somehow. Yeah, he, well, yeah. that was a good one. <laughs> I gotta tell you, you ever seen Hunter Biden debate? Cool, wisecrack. <laughs> He's a wisecracker. <laughs> <laughs> See, everybody, he smokes a lot of crack, so I'm making jokes about how much crack he smokes. And you can't say they wasn't given the opportunity. Excuse me, to pick up. The Stop laptop. biting your cigar and you won't have to spit out pieces of it. Sorry. You're right. Guys, um, he's filleting his cigar over here. I'm a biter. I'm cringing. I'm a biter. I like it's it. Like, Dude, get the teeth off of it. <laughs> so, so if he would, he, he had the opportunity. They reached out to him multiple times to get the laptop back. And then they were just like, well, there's things on here that we shouldn't even be seeing. And, you know, we don't want you to get hurt. It's, hey, look, you know, Delaware's a... Um, it's an all democratic state, so they, they look out, they look out for each other. You know what I mean? And he didn't, so he had to give it you know, contractually. He had to give it over to the authorities. Dude, if you're gonna do crack and have hookers and leave stuff on there about your dad, dummy, why don't you go get the laptop or get an assistant to get the laptop? Don't be an asshole. And I know they know how to do it. They know Hillary Clinton. They yeah, know, they know how to Hillary, wipe devices Hillary, like that. Dude, Hillary set these people straight. <laughs> Pull, pull I mean, come on, honestly. I mean, look, you got away with everything, Hillary. Dude, teach them what to do. I know what Hunter's problem was. He was planning on do it, but he hadn't done it yet. He was biding his time. <laughs> he was biding his time. He was biding his time. We need to put a disclaimer. Like YouTube's probably gonna ban this because like we have some rule of ridiculous puns and you've broken yes. it. Yes. So we're demonetizing you before you've even <laughs> gotten a nickel from us. No, I mean, like, I, I'm a fair as fair kind of guy. I'm a, you know, I, I did what I did for my country twice because I believe in us. And um, I think, yeah, like, like, come on, dude, get your stuff together. <laughs> like, your dad was a vice president and now he's president elect, supposedly. You know what I mean? I almost did I, that all. Oh, it's not a cigarette, I do John. do it now. Man. We're doing good about the drinking game. I hope everybody's playing at home. I'm I'm very mindful 
yes. of of so, the words that I say now. So anytime someone says, <laughs> you got to drink. You got to drink. And I got to drink. And that's even 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 in giving the instructions, you have broken the rules. Yes, I so have. So that sucks. Put a little disclaimer down there. <laughs> so you were in the military twice. Yeah. What? I know. I know you had mentioned last week. Oh, that's right. I told you guys I would tell you my military story of why I went in. Now, this is a good one. Get ready for this. So when I was a young teenager, my dad would tell me these stories about when he was in the military. He had all his paraphernalia. You know, he had his, his, his books and he had pictures and he would tell me these stories about, oh, that guy right there would have to shave his forehead because he grew so much hair. He just made it sound like awesome. And then on top of that, he would tell me these stories about, and he was in during like the Vietnam time. And uh, he would tell me these horror stories about like, you know, what they did and, 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 the, and the, the craziness of it all and the, and the missions they were on. And he just, he made it sound like he was a, a badass. So I was not the best uh, student because I always wanted to do other things, hang out with my friends, play music, stuff like that. Um, well, when I was of age, I went into the military on a whim, literally to one up my dad after a conversation where he's like, oh, you could never, no, it was, it was my cousin and my dad. My cousin John had, he had gone in and my dad was so proud of him. And he was like, oh, but you could never do something like that. I was like, what? And he's like, oh, my cousin said the same exact thing. He said, look, you could, you could never take what I went through. And I said, okay. So on a whim, I went down to the recruiting station and, and I, I joined as I'm going through, you go through this process at maps at where they, they, you know, you take what's called the ASFAB. I took the ASFAB and my numbers scored really high. I wouldn't say really, I mean, they were above average. Um, and they basically said, dude, you could do whatever you want. Like, what do you want to do? So I went and I, uh, I, I was like, no, listen, I said, I'm, I'm here for one reason only. That's the one up my dad. My dad told me these crazy stories, so I want the craziest job you have. So the guy was like, Do so you clean toilets? Yeah, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> so so I was like, I was like, so I want to be in the the mix. I want to be the guy. I want to be that. And they were like, oh well, yeah, there's Rangers or Special Forces. And I said, Cool, well, that sounds great. And they said, Well, what MOS do you want to go for? MOS is your job description, what you train to do in the military. So they were like, Well, you, you need to be a, a Cav Scout. And I was like, what? What's a Cavs guy? And they were like, oh, they're the eyes and ears of the, of the military. So, oh, okay. So give me a list. So I look at the list of everything they do from mine sweeping to reconnoitering land to having to ford bridges and, and then tell how much mathematically if something can hold, if it, a bridge can actually hold the largest uh, vehicle that's in our military. And so I was like, heck yeah. And they were like, oh, and by the way, you're going to be that lone people out there in a very small group, unless you're mechanized. And that's a whole different animal. But the unmechanized uh, guys would go forward of everything. So I'm like, heck yeah, that's my job. So I'm out there. I'm in the Bulls of steel, he's got. Yes. So we go out. Uh, well, I go out into what they call OSA training, which is a, it's a one source. It's like, so instead of going to what you would be trained on to do your military job and your basic training, you do these things together. So I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to one up my dad. I'm going to show him I'm a man. Yeah. <laughs> Not only was I shit scared because of the job I picked. I just I was, hope you told your dad in that voice. Oh, what no, you no, did. No. Dad, I'm a scout. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. Well, I, I did eventually. I was when I, I actually had a chance to actually because they stop you from talking to anybody. Right, right. The, you know, outside the military. Because they're they're brainwashing you. They're they're throwing their spin. They're they're like they're gonna break you all the way down and then build you back up in what they need. Uh, so I took it very serious. Like when we were going through like uh, how to disarm mines or whatever, I took it serious. Like I, I would never fall asleep during classes. I would never do any. Anyway, I'm, I'm dragging this out. So I get done. I actually served um, through the OSA training. I actually got excellence cavalry, excellence in armor, 
and I got awarded like uh, so you go everyone comes in as a private I came out as a private first class uh, like right out of right out of OSA training so I go to my first unit I get there and I'm, not, I'm like yes I'm reporting I go in and report to my commander he goes what are you doing because uh, I put my bags down he goes well, what are you doing I was like what do you mean what am I doing he goes pick your fucking bags up and get on the bus and I was like whoa, whoa, whoa. oh yes sir yes sir so I take my bags. I'm thinking I'm going to the barracks because they, they, once you get to your first unit, they normally go, look, ah, oh, you're good. No, we were, we were shipped off to Iraq. I mean, literally, I had no time to breathe. I literally came back from the flight, got there, reported to my commander, and guess what? Boom. I was off. I was off. All the things in my stuff, they were giving me stuff in route. It was crazy. So we're coming in. I remember it very vividly. We're coming in, and, and, and we're getting shot at. Punka, punka, punka. They're sh trying to shoot the C-130, dragging us in. I'm like, this is crazy. Like, this is insane. Like, what did I do? So we, the plane, the plane lands. I get out there. We get our first, uh, you know, op order. Op order takes us out. We're doing these crazy missions. And then we're supposed to be also training the Kuwaitis on how to take care of themselves. So I'm like, this is, this is nuts. You know, I'm doing all this crazy stuff. I, I, we actually drove out into a land, uh, like a, a big minefield, which freaked me out. And then we were getting shot at. We were doing missions. Long story short. I had a small, very small break to where I was writing my dad. And the entire time I was going through my OSA training, I had a drill sergeant who was just about to get off trail. That's what they call when you stop be, being a, a drill sergeant and you go to your unit. So this guy the whole time is like, oh, I keep telling my dad's a badass. And it helped motivate me because whenever we had like hand to hand or whatever, they would like, they would really take it serious with me. And I was a wrestler growing up. So I was, I was pretty good on my feet. Um, so long story short, this guy gets off the trail and the whole time he's there, he's like, oh, your dad was badass, your dad was a badass. I was like, yeah. He goes, well, what's his, what's his social? I'll find out what he was. Cause I kept saying, I didn't know what his MOS was. Cause this is all new to me. Being in the military is new to me. I come from a very well-to-do family up north and that's Yeah, we worth. established that Silver Spoon boy. <laughs> I'm not saying I was Silver Spoon. I just said I was better off than some people, you know? So anyway. Like everyone else. <laughs> so long story short, this, this guy tells me while we're at, we, we're in this cabal where they like put all this dirt up and you're like you're in the center of it um and that's where you kind of like you refresh do your stuff and then you get pushed back out into the field so we're out there and he gets back to me he goes he goes hey welsh how about you come over here so we can have a conversation and i was like uh, yes sergeant okay let's do it so i'm, I'm standing there we're talking he goes yeah we uh we found out what your dad uh, did in the military and um yeah, he wasn't a badass. And I was like, I was like, yeah, he was a super badass. <laughs> <laughs> Drink. <laughs> so I said, yeah, he's a mm, badass, huh? And he goes, no, 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 private. He is a, or he was a shoe repairman. I said, a what? I said, yeah, the guys who repair the shoes, that's what your dad's MOS was. Here I am. Calf scout, shot at already. I haven't even been in what six months. I was going through minefields, uh, literally having to quake, quakey people where it's, they, they don't speak any English, so you have interpreters and no one understands. Uh, I'm going through this crazy crap, getting shot. Yeah, at. but you weren't a cobbler. <laughs> <laughs> so we go through all this crap. Listen to this. I text. I text. Yeah, I wish I text back then. I wrote a letter to my dad because I had some downtime. I started out, you, Emmer, Effer. You told me all these things about all these stories about how you were in the thick of it and everything. Oh, I, the kicker on this thing. My dad was National Guard. He told me he was regular army. Oh. oh. He never even left the United oh. States. So all those stories, he lied. I guess he was trying to motivate me or whatever. Oh, he motivated me all right to did, go did, in the military. Did he tell you he loved you too? <laughs> no, he never said that. My dad wasn't that guy. So I get there. I write this letter, this nasty letter to my dad. I get a letter back in three weeks. All he said was, I pissed myself laughing. And then it was like, ha, 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 ha. Because I told him about all the things that happened to me so far in country. And I get a ha, 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 ha back. Why so serious, man? <laughs> it still pisses me off to this day. <laughs> Way to go, Mr. Welsh. All right. I'll do that. And the kicker 
Didn't you get tortured? Yeah, well, no, that was um, that was later on in the in the thing because you go through um, seer training. If, if you're picked to go on shadow teams and stuff like that, they stick you in these like really uh, small groups, and then they to train for it, they put you in, uh, they bottleneck you, they make you go into all these things. And long story short, you go if you go through seer training, you, you know what I'm talking about. All right, if you're I'm gonna, a military I'm gonna commercial person, break. Seer training, you understand the story here. It's a great story, but I'm almost done with my first start, and I wanted to give a few notes for the audience. Um, there is a little bit of a hazelnut that I'm picking up. Yeah, because you're gabbing. Time. You're just flapping them gums yeah. instead of smoking while I'm over here riveted to my seat and just you know, <laughs> sucking it down like Aunt Hazel. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really good. I'm really enjoying it. And I, I, this is better than I remembered it being. So kudos, Gary. Good call. One of these days, I'm going to tell the story of the greatest wrong number in the history of wrong numbers. And the, that story is called the Gary's Mama. So I'll have to tell that one day. Oh, I'm intrigued. Oh, it's, it's a big story. It's the biggest story I ever told on stage. I'm intrigued. So it takes a while. So I'm going to have to get my notes out and remember it because it's, it's a big, big, big to do. Speaking of that, let's, let's, let's go into that a little bit. Um, most people don't know that you were pretty, you were, you were a pretty good comedian. I dabbled. Oh, I, you dabbled. No, no, no. See, he says I dabbled, but I'm telling you right now, I, uh, I know people that he knows that he done sh that he's done shows with and they call him the, the math guy the nerdy math joke teller it was the comedian. mathematician that the was mathematician, that, that was my stage was. name that's what he and, said and and i my whole show my whole approach to comedy was what i didn't re i didn't know it at the time but it was autism it was it was it was such a lateral way of approaching comedy it was such a geeky way of doing it that it caught people off guard but it worked because it turned comedy on its head and so I would do things that other comedians would do, but I would make fun of it. So how many times have you seen a comedian try to bond with his audience by making a call to action where it'd be like, how many single ladies in the room do we have? Let me hear you clap. You know, and it was always yeah. like, by, by show of applause, how many people hate pancakes or whatever? And so I would always look at what a comedy show did. I kind of like formalize it into, okay, well, there's the intro of the show. There's the closure of the show. There's how the comedian like establishes a rapport with the audience. So like I formalized it and I just kind of created an, an algorithm where I made my, my bits and I would do things like I would make fun of what they were doing and so one of the ways I would do that is I would get on stage and I was like by a round of applause everybody who hates to clap and then whoever would clap would be like you're an idiot <laughs> <laughs> and people liked it because they're like okay we didn't expect to get insulted in such a clever way and so they just kind of Came back to it, but yes, I... I That's actually a good one. <laughs> I was a comic. Uh, I started in 2003, and I finished in, in 2013. I didn't, I didn't serve America the way you did, you know, putting your life on the line and, and taking bullets for people. I put my life on the line and made fun of people, and hopefully they laughed at it and not wanting to hurt hey, me. Hey, dude, it, it needs... It, there's, a, there's a whole big world out there. Everyone needs somebody. You know, and that's a good, that's honorable. But I enjoyed it. It was something I had always wanted to do. So it's a, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't to one up my dad or anything like that. You know, it's probably get back at your dad. <laughs> well, that's that's everything else in my life, really. <laughs> my life is 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 one big uh, descent. You know, just like no, no dad doing something different. But uh, I had well, actually. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. What? How far did you go in your career? Like, like where did you want it to go? I'm sorry. We're well, um, when I started, I had no idea if I was going to make it. You know, I just knew that nobody knows that, that, they're gonna that, that I was a funny guy. I and, was a and, rock star. We didn't know we were going to. And make people, it. people liked listening to to me cut up. And I, I, I had always worshipped the stand up comedian. I remember as a child watching. Um, Loss of Control. I think that was it was a Nickelodeon show with Dave Coulier, and it was it was his character, and then there was this this Cindy Lauper wannabe, like a budget Cindy Lauper okay, that they okay. had. The Walmart. It, yeah, it was a like Kmart special. Yeah. Uh, Bogo, Cindy Lauper, and then there may have been a couple of the characters, and Dave Coulier would have these little intermissions in the show because it's like a sketch comedy show. Intermissions where he'd be on stage telling his little bits, and for a six year old, you know, the bar is pretty low. You can pick your nose and, yeah, we'll, and we'll laugh at it. And he had this little thing where he would he would say something, and then once the crowd would laugh, he'd say, cut it out, and he would actually go, cut it out. 
that's where that started. He used that later on Full House and uh, when he when he hosted America's Funniest People. But but really that that's that's that was his shtick. That was his little gimmick. And I really really liked it. I wanted to do that, but I had no idea how I was going to start. And and and, and the the thing that kicked the whole thing off was my my buddy Andrew got married in and he and he watches the show so andrew you you, you know up, that, andrew? that that you played a pivotal role in a a 10 year long comedy career that spans several states uh wild right i he got married and i got asked to do a toast and i i never follow instructions my wife will tell you i don't follow instructions maybe it's kind of a disability i don't know but every time <laughs> i used to tell people i'm so bad at following instructions when i was in high school <laughs> i had to turn in a short essay and i brought a mexican midget that's how bad i was with with instructions <laughs> sorry i'm sorry that was <laughs> but it's illustrative of the point you know i just don't think right <laughs> I'm totally like that reaction. I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom in right here. Get <laughs> Sorry, that was pretty good. So I hear you know he says, "Hey, we, we'd like you to write us," and I'm thinking roast, <laughs> one letter off, one letter off. Yeah, and so I get roast. together and I just put together this like 15 minute set, just tearing he and his wife up, just but like in the most comedic of ways, and I did not have the honor of being like the headliner toaster because I wasn't best man. That went to the best man. So I was, I was like the feature toaster. <laughs> I was the little toaster that could. I, toaster I was the tall gangly coaster that, <laughs> toaster that could. So it's, it, we're doing the reception and like I'm going through my, I'm going through my bits. I'm going through my, and I didn't realize like I was basically doing a comedy set. I didn't think about it like that. I just, I, I had, I had written a piece of paper with basically the, the, the cue words for yeah. the jokes I was going to do. So I get up there and I start, I start going and I'm killing. And I remember, the, and this is a room, I don't know any of these people. I know, I know Andrew and his wife and like their most immediate connection their their circle but beyond that i didn't know any of those people i mean it was like it was jim olivier from meet your neighbor was, was there and that's an old show anyway he was there and i'm just doing my thing and all these old people are just falling out of their chairs laughing about it and i'm thinking i really like this this is a lot of fun and i finish and then shane the best man gets up there and he just says well, how the hell am I supposed to follow that? And then he gets there and he does his little best idea. But people people come up to me after the toast and they're like, you were hysterical. Like, are you a comic? And I said, no. No. <laughs> I'm a mathematician. Yes. I'm a nerd. And they said, no, really, you should, you should try it. We think you could do it. You have the timing. And I'm like, really? Well, so like that got me thinking about it. And I was, I was curious, but like I wasn't committed to doing it because I really didn't know how to get started. Well, then my sister gets married. You know what you got? You what? got the itch. It, the entertainment itch. It, Everybody gets it. Every it was once there in a while. for real. You ever get out on a dance floor, people, and then you're like, you start cutting up, and people start clapping, and then they start, oh yeah, oh keep going. People look at you're me. Like, okay, you're, you're over, you're over, way. You right? You're welcome. Like go, go. Like we all thought it was cool for a second. Go ahead. Okay. So they they get married, and I'm thinking, are, are y'all gonna want me to do another one of these roast things? Because like I need to notice. Well, it, it was kind of informal, and, and and no one asked me to prepare anything, and so yeah. I'm like, okay, fine. You know, it's it's your it's your show. So if you if you don't want to do like the full, I love the formal dramatic. Like everybody takes a turn giving a toast because I'm super extra. <laughs> if anybody knows me, I am extra AF. You In think? fact, I'd probably add a few more letters to the AF. Why? Because <laughs> I'm extra. Because you know? you're extra. I'm just extra like that. So my sister goes get married, and we're at the reception, and. My sister gets, stands up to give a toast. And I'm like, you son of a bitch. Because now I'm going to look like a douchebag if I don't give a toast and I don't have anything prepared. So this is this is uncool. Well, my sister gives a toast and it's nice. And so I'm thinking, okay, I've got probably three minutes before she wraps up. i got to come up with some stuff now. So I just start going through like everything that's embarrassing about my sister. And I'm just going off of that. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then then I get up and I'm like, well, here we go. And I just improv a yeah, set you're so quick on your feet. about you my sister and I slayed everybody and then again I had people from the groom you know my brother-in-law his family came up to me asking me if I was a comic and I was like no I, I'm not and they said you should try it you have the timing and I said alright that's enough I've had two discreet different groups of strangers tell me I need to do this I'm gonna do this. so then I found an open mic 
in Lafayette, and I went and told them, I'd like to do a set. And they said, really? Because mostly it's just emos who do poetry or really bad acoustic guitar music. And I was like, no, seriously, I will blend in perfectly with that. So they let me go, and I told all my friends, and we showed up, and I did a little set. And it was difficult. It was very, because that's where I realized being funny and being a comic are two totally different things. Yeah. Because it's different skill sets. One yeah. is you're just reacting to a situation in a way that's amusing to people. But with a comedian, it's all contrived. It's all staged. Every moment of that set is fabricated ahead of time, engineered to deliver an intended effect on the audience. And also when, when they're when they're when the joke's not going well, you can orchestrate it. That's to go right. That's way. right. Yeah. And you have to do it in such a way that it looks off the cuff. Yes. And so that was very, very, but I, but I realized right away, that's what I was dealing with. So I went to work abstracting, you know, the psychology behind being an audience versus being a comic. And I started playing off of it and I, I caught traction and I ended up giving myself a stage room in math petition. I leaned into it because you know, I was a math petition. And the way, the way I would start off, because you have to endear yourself to the room. So the very first joke I would ever do is I would say, you want to know why I'm called a math petition? And they would all say, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least I pretended they would. They probably didn't give a rat's ass, but you know, I was in my mind. They were like, yeah. They were also in their underwear, so I was probably just imagining <laughs> it. But whatever. So I was like, cool. So I said, I'm going to need some volunteers from the audience to make this mental magic work. And so I said, I need somebody to give me an integer between 1 and 10. I could have said a number, but that would have been too pedestrian. So I had, I had to see more like, oh, he's got credentials, right? So I said integer, just for that reason, no other reason. So, well, actually there was another reason, because if I'd been the audience and someone had said, I didn't number doing I'd have said pie. And then it'd be like, you screwed my joke up, you dick. And I'd be like, ha, ha, ha. So I was like, none of those people. So integer yeah. between, between one and 10. So someone would raise their hand and say seven. And I'm like, great, I need another person. Give me an integer between one and 10. They'd say two. And I'd say, all right, so you hear that everybody? We got seven. And we got two. All right, you ready for this? And I'd go, nine. <laughs> and I'd say, I know what you're thinking. How in the world did he do that? Well, I'm going to tell you how. Because I'm an effing mathematician. <laughs> and it was so stupid. It was such a stupid joke. But because it was like all this buildup, It'd be like me doing a point, but like, are you ready for this John Holmes Lexington steel? And then it's like a Vienna sausage and like a tuna can, you know, it'd be like, oh, that was, that was not the delivery we were expecting for. So that, I would do that to kind of let them know this is not going to be your typical comic set. But what I will tell you to give you an idea of, of, of the way I approach humor, I will tell you the most famous joke I ever told. This is, I, I yeah, okay, go. You've never, no, I haven't told this joke in over 10 years. Well, guess what I want to hear? You want to hear it? Okay. Um, just to let the audience know. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to let you know. I'm going to steal it if it's good. I'm going to tell it everywhere I know. I would love for you to steal this joke because <laughs> you haven't heard it yet. No, no. But I once haven't. I tell it, you're going to be like, I'm not telling that joke. Okay. <laughs> but this is your famous. The this, is, this is the joke that whenever I did an improv set and I asked the audience to tell me jokes, they would mm -hmm. always ask me to do that joke. Okay, so here it is. So I wanted to buy a butt plug. And the store only had a pink one. And I said, nah, that's kind of gay. <laughs> that's not a bad joke. That's a good joke. I would tell that in only certain crowds. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. You wouldn't want me to take it the wrong way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> See, he's a witty titty. He's good. So good. I'm just messing with you, John. I'm just messing with you a bit. So, little nobbins on the but going, but going back to the story of the comedy career, we, we started off at Club 307 downtown. That was where the open mic was. And it didn't take long before I would write a new show every week. And I got noticed. I had a little fan base. People would come to see me every week. There were a bunch of crap comedians, and that made it easy to write material because I would just make fun of them because I'd yeah. always go after them. So that was, that was really, really helpful. I would talk about how we needed to go into counseling together. Because we'd all witnessed that same abuse from the previous comic. <laughs> you know, just, I was mean. But I was like, if you're going to be on stage, you either have to be good or figure out that you suck and get the hell off. You know, but yeah. if, you, if you stay up there and just waste everybody's time, you're, you're rude. And you deserve to be humiliated. And so yeah. I, was, I was that guy. I was the punisher, you know. And I got a lot of flack from a lot of comics. But I did my first headline show in 2005, I believe. Uh, I had won a contest. 
to, to headline over there. And then that's when I started getting paid. And I was like, oh my God, people are paying me to be stupid. And so I'd go up and, and, and do all kind of. What was it? What was your sets? What, what did you get paid for a set? It depended on the room. The most I ever got was like 500. I bet you there's a lot, a lot of people out there going, like, 500, that's a lot, man. Oh, it man. was a lot. We set, this, we set the attendance record at 307. We, we broke the law. We had, we had standing room only. All, all around there, it was, it was amazing. It was really awesome. But so that was your, that was your first show. That was my first headline gig where, like, we did posters advertising the mathematician as headlining, and we had like 280 people in a 212 capacity room. Dude, that's amazing. It was, it was a rush. Like I could not believe. I've been there. You don't and, have to tell and me. And I was like, rush. I got hooked. to itch too. I want to take this as far as I can go. And I wanted to go pro, but I, but as I learned how the comedy industry works, you basically have to live in your vehicle and just drive around until you, you, you and you just do little shows where you're making scratch. But as far as like getting a big time, getting a Netflix special or something like that, which Netflix didn't exist back then, but you know, that was, you, you had to whore yourself out to the industry and hope you got picked up by somebody big. And I wasn't prepared to do that because I, I had a family and I had, I had a career, you know, I had a math PhD and I was going to law school. And so I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do all that stuff. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stay here and have my fun. And so let me ask you a quick question. So how, how that was, two, you said 2013? 2013 was when I finished. That's when last you show. finished. That was okay. my last show. So when did, there's a, there's another local comic around here, but he did something different. He was, um, it's Poo Poo Broussard. Uh, when was he? Yeah, that's right around that time. Like he was in I that remember same him. mix. He was yeah. in that same mix. He did not. He did not perform in the circles that I that I ran with. I, I I ran with the late great Chris Fontana out of New Orleans and Baton Rouge, and there was Magic Mike, and and then there was uh, um, uh, I can't remember all their names, but there was Mista, a couple of the Baton Rouge guys, and then yeah. we'd bring them all in and we'd do shows, and it was like. Wednesday nights or Tuesday nights and for open mics we would have standing room only shows at 307 by the end of it it was awesome and the and I remember uh, the first time I got asked to open up for a road comic like an actual named comic that was like Halloween of 2008 and I was super super excited you, you're not even catching me slacking me no no I am trust me I'm, I'm paying attention <laughs> alright there's two right there damn it so it was, uh, what was his name? Ah, I can't remember his name. Anyway, I get contacted to do, it was, it was a two show night, which I'd never done that before. It was always, I do one set and then I'm out, but there was an early evening show and a late show. Well, real quick, I don't mean to cut you off, but would you be open to uh, other comics coming here? Like I, like I, I met that Poo Poo Bruce art guy. I met him. Uh, on a Destin trip with one of my buddies. Would you be open to him and then coming on? Because I'm pretty sure he's a big cigar smoker. If it's good for the show, it's good for me. Yeah. I don't, I don't care. But you two back and forth, I can only imagine the conversations I, I between you two. I don't care. It was Scotty K. That's who it was. Scotty K. Scotty K. That's, that's the first headliner that I was asked to. Actually, it was John Morgan. I did it. But that was a little set in the, at the Funny Bone in Baton Rouge, which was really, really cool. That was the biggest I like the Funny Bone. Is it still around? Like I uh, last I heard. Last I heard it okay. was. But I did, I did two Halloween shows with Scotty K, and I was extremely nervous. I would have, I, I would have been the other word for nervous, but I'm trying not to yeah, fall no, off my it. stool here. So <laughs> I, had to, I had to like get up. And do a show and then like recover. I felt like Hoist Gracie in an early UFC where it was like, I gotta go do this again. Oh my god, I gotta okay. Cause like there's a serious oh, yeah, drop off. Yeah, oh yeah, you, you know, do, when yeah. you get off stage, then be like, all right, turn it around, you know. So that was a lot of work. And because it was Halloween, I was like, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do my whole set in costume. Because it's Halloween. But it's gonna be it's gonna be a me costume, which means it's gonna be out of left field and very, very weird. So I picked out this costume. Yeah, I can only imagine. You would, if you would have seen what he went out as for Halloween this year, I'm going to put the picture right oh, here. Oh, really, because, dude? Yeah, I'm putting it out there. Wow. That was insane. Like, he went all the way. Like, we, we conceptualized it while we were on a trip to, to Denver, but let me tell you something. He took it to a whole other level. It, it, I'm, just look at the picture right now. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> You're going to be laughing oh just like I am. <laughs> I feel so exposed, John. Yes, you were, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> oh, my God. So my costume was I, I, I went on stage with no shoes, no socks, no shirt, just no underwear, just a pair of jeans. 
I get on stage, I walk out there, everybody's looking at me like, all right, what are so we looking homeless at? Homeless guy? And I, and I told them, I'm in costume. And they give me this quizzical, confounded look, as, as one will do. Yeah. And I say, I'm a premature ejaculation. I just came in my pants. <laughs> that was, that was, I, and that was, <laughs> that was how I started my show. And it was such an easy pop because yeah. it, was, it was a stupid joke and it was funny. And then, it's funny. And then after I did the joke, then I was like, oh, crap. Now I've got to do the whole rest of my 30 minutes sad in my fucking pants. <laughs> it was cold on stage, so that was, that was uncomfortable. So, so let me ask you another question. I'm sorry. I don't mean to keep cutting you off. But I, I got questions, so many questions about this kind of stuff. So what was your biggest show? My biggest show. Like I'm talking about your most famous show, the one, not the one at 337 where you guys packed the place, but I'm talking right. about like something uh, that was like special to you because you were just like, I'm there with some other big comedian or whatever. Well, it's funny because I, I had I had done shows with John Morgan and I did shows with Scotty K and I did shows with Mark Ryan. And those were those were those were big name guys on a national scene, and I I, I cherish those memories because we we would just cut up because the thing about being a, a comic on that level, you're quick. And, and, and that was one thing I really wanted to see was if no one's looking, what is it going to be like if I go sit with this guy and we start riffing? You know, I just want to banter. I don't want to go as fast as I can. And it was awesome because it was like two, it was like the number one and number two tennis player playing a match. But they were trying to keep it going. It was just fast. Bam, bam, bam. I don't, yeah. I don't know who famous tennis players are because I'm, I'm straight. So I don't know that stuff. But, um, uh, yeah, it was like that. It was super fast. Boom. Drink. I'm catching myself here. It was very fast, and it was really funny. We just cut each other up the whole time. That was, awesome. but as far as like the biggest honor uh, in law school, I had to tone it down a lot because law school is a lot of work, yeah. and so I wasn't able to just write shows every week. It, it, I, I toned it down a lot, and by the end, uh, I graduated in 2012. I had, I had almost like giving it up I wasn't really doing any, any shows anymore just because of the effort and we kept changing venues and it was hard to have a reliable place so I wasn't really doing much but I get a call out of the blue and it's like yeah you want to do a show and I'm thinking well, who wants to know and he says Doug Stanhope Doug Stanhope I said wait Doug Stanhope the Doug Stanhope of the guy show the man show yeah. Like, yeah him and Joe Rogan he's doing a show in Lafayette and we need we need uh, we need the best local guy, and you're the damn. Guy. They said we need the best local guy. Boom! They called him. And I said, "I'm your guy." I said, "I'm your Huckleberry." <laughs> and so, I'll be your Huckleberry. and so, uh, I was like, "How? Tell me the details. You know, when, where, how long do you need me to fill?" And they said, "How much you want to do?" And I said, "Dude, I'll tell you what, for a Doug Stanhope show, I'll do thirty minutes." And I'll, 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 I'll get up there and I That's will, a special. I will slay that show, that, that, that room for Doug to get out there. And I said, perfect. And so I had a, I had a few months notice and I, I went to work and I just cranked, cranked, cranked material out and tailored it. And I was like, dude, it was going to be my opus. And so I'm so excited. To you perform. almost said it. I told all my friends, I was like, man. All right, we're, we're you know go to the go to the station in Broussard on this. It was like May thirteenth, twenty thirteen, whatever. May tenth. It was May tenth, twenty thirteen. I'm on the I remember that stuff. Anyway, so everybody shows up, and I get there, and my normal pre-show routine was very uh, hermetic. I, I I go off on my own, and I'm not one of those guys who wants to meet with the comics and party because I'm in the zone, and I'm going I'm going through everything to the point where like it's just. It's, 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 it's like you're just pushing play on the projector that is me and the show comes out. Yeah. And it looks, it looks completely impromptu, but it's completely fabricated. That's just how I did it. Yeah, pull the mic a little bit closer to you. So, so make sure you get it. I get there, but I'm thinking, well, I don't want to be rude. I mean, I have to go talk to Doug because this is a big deal for me. So I, I need a hobnob. So I go, I go into his dressing room area and... He's wearing this ridiculous... It's Doug Stanhope. He's wearing a Doug Stanhope outfit, basically, yeah. is what it is. And I go I to saw, I had some brief encounters with Doug Stanhope. Uh, DK from the Yellow Rose. Oh, God, we had, we had yeah. some nights. Yeah, so right off the bat, he's like, what you drinking? I'm thinking, oh, man, I really, I really don't drink before my shows because that's going to put me off my game a little bit. You know, everything is... is 
designed to work a certain way, but I can't tell him no, because mama didn't raise no punk. So I said, uh, whatever you're drinking, Doug, that was a mistake. Yeah, that was a mistake. That was a mistake, because he drinks Drano. It, 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 yeah, it was, he gets it in. It was, it, he was just like, things. all right, well, uh, here, take a tankard of vodka. That's what we're drinking. And I'm thinking, oh, oh, this is going to be a, a difficult show. And so he gets me shit-faced, hammered, and then they tell me, oh, by the way, cut it down to six minutes. Oh. And I'm just like, you messing with me. You, di <laughs> you didn't just do that. You got me hammered. And then say, oh, by the way, take the 30-minute set that has a very well-manicured opening, intro, middle, finale, and closer. And cut, just, just stitch it up into six little, six little minutes for me. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. This is so I, I, I did it. I pulled it off, and I put together a tight little six-minute set, and people liked it. But I was just, just But as far as, like, the biggest, to me, that's, that's my biggest accomplishment because, I, to me, that let me know I made it. I could have I done big things, but I, I just didn't. And then after that, I was just like, I got stuff to do. I'm running a company. So, so that's, why you, that's why you stopped doing it? Well, I, I enjoyed spending more time with my kids. And uh, with, with, with what I was doing in my life, it was like something I had to give. And so I, 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 I just quit doing it. And there wasn't, a, there wasn't a room that had the prestige that we had built. Like we had built a comedy scene in Lafayette, but then there was the schism where a couple of guys who really weren't worth their, their salt, worth their pay, they, they took the market hostage essentially because they thought they should be paid. And what they did is they ruined the reputation of Lafayette comedy. So no one wanted to go anymore. And so the, the fervor, that buzz that we had created where people were like, all right, it's Wednesday night. Where's the math petition playing? Let's go. It, it died. It was just people thought it was all just that those other guys. And so I, I just took that as my sign from God that, okay, that, that ship has sailed. So there you go. Well, I don't think that ship has sailed. I think you're, you still have big things to come. I have all of our fans counting on us. Yeah. I, have to, I have to make content for them. So I don't know. I don't we're we're going to do. We're going to make some. Some pretty, we're gonna bring in guests. I'm gonna see if I can get Doug Stanhope to come in here. That would I, be I could, wild. I could still, I mean, you guys could reminisce for your six minutes. <laughs> we go back six whole minutes. Well, I don't know if I can even reach out to him anymore. I mean, I know he's still doing stuff. Um, I mean, DK hasn't been doing well, uh, these past few years. Um, Mike Persinger, I'm sure, I'm sure. I Let's get back to the cigars for a second. How's your, how's yours holding up? It, it's been so pleasant that I was like, you know what. I, this is not a Connecticut to me. This is like a. This is a robust Connecticut. This is, I mean, this is, this is, it just doesn't taste. To take a phrase from my father-in-law, this would be a Connecticut Rustico. It's a Rustico, Connecticut. Oh my God. I don't, yeah. Uh, so the, the pepper still on the back end. Like when, when you, after that aftertaste so I get the, um, I'm still getting the pepper. I'm still getting all the same draw in the front. It's a little heavier in the middle third. It is, it is a heavier smoke. It is, yeah. For it, it, it's only a Connecticut in name. The, the feel, the taste, yeah. Ev everything you. about I'm it is more you. of a sun grown. I'm, I, I would almost not want to let people know that I enjoy these as much as I do because number one, it's a Connecticut. Number two, it's What's really cheap. Smoke? You know, it, it is a, it is a fan. This would really go well. With a good coffee, because yeah, a good because, coffee in this. Come on, because the caramel and hazelnut notes that yeah. would it would go fantastic with some coffee. But as far as the the comedy thing, I don't know. I still have people to this day asking me to go back on stage and do something, and I, I think about it every now and again. But I don't know. But you could do it every once in a while, you know, what once a month. That's not a lot. It is when you're in all the stuff that I'm in. So you, you're I, right about that. You are in a lot of stuff. I'm in. I got my hands in a lot of honey pots. Because I know when we were we, we would do shows, we would uh, we could orchestrate, you know, uh, a long set or a short set. It all depended on the gig. So I understand. And then you got to practice that stuff. Like you know what I mean? That's why you do the little shows to get to that big show. You know? It's not like riding a bike. It's more like ice skating. Because when you're doing it a lot, it's effortless. You don't think about it. But if you take a lot of years off. You get out there and like, yeah, yeah you kind of know how to do it, but man, that rust element is really prevalent, and and, and you fall on your ass a lot, and yeah. that's one of those things that 
that that's a little daunting to me is, is trying to have to manage that that rust and, and, and get, get, it, get my chops up to the point where like I'm lethal again. I used to, who's calling? Uh, that's a, uh, man, we're filming. Can't be talking to you right now. Sorry. Sorry, I have to call you back. Uh, but real quick, um, so where are you at? Where are you guys at with this? Are you feeling the same thing we are? Are you seeing the same things we're seeing? Are you still getting those hazelnut, the, the pepper? Is it still burning the same way it is for us? Let us know in the comments, please. Because we want, we're, we're here with you. I buddy. don't want people to think that this is a, 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 a rubbish bin smoke because of its price point. It, it really is. You know this this competes For 750 this competes this is... extremely well with the rp vintage 99 it competes very well with the monte cristo connecticut this this has the flavor almost of an the airbender monte cristo? i don't think i don't think it's with that. i don't I, I find connecticut connecticut's too thin this has this has more of a flavor thickness to it that i that i favor i prefer that that's why that's all i'm saying okay but yeah Hey, to each his own. That's right. To it's a free country. A this, free. At least for the time being, it for, is. For right now, it's a free country until they tell us it's not a free country. Right. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> oh, I'm trying not man. to oversmoke this thing. I mean, it's it's going so well that if I don't watch this, it's, it's going to be a lot. It's certainly not. It's not going to be the, the two hour Hamlet smoke. That we had last week. Yeah, that was. I don't even know where we're at right now. I think we're like an hour in, something like that. That was. Camping. That was intense. Okay. So, next, next on the itinerary. Yeah. Did you want to hear some more jokes? Yeah, I want to hear some more jokes. What are you crazy? Yes. Keep me laughing. All right. Oh, by the way, by the way, I, that's fine. I will, I will tell the jokes this week. Next week, you're gonna play us some songs, Nickelback boy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know, totally. I'll put a I'll put a little song up in there. We'll put it in our score, the music app. I will. Right. There's so many, and there's so many stories about how those songs came to life. You know, some of them I wrote about my dad when he first passed away, and because uh, he died like right in the beginning of my mil of my military my uh, my music career, I, like like right in the beginning. So that influenced a couple songs. Uh, one of them made a made an album. So um, that's, you write so many songs, and then the, like you say, okay, here's 35 songs, and you break it down to like 12 or 10 or whatever. Um, but yeah, like, dude, my, some of some of the music that we had was influenced by different people. I, I mean, like I can name drop all day long, but I mean, the people who put us there, man. It's like, like you, like it was just like people reached out to us and they were just like, ah, you should try this, you should do this, you should do that. And when we actually got it to come to life, whatever producer we were working with at the time, sometimes it was just us, you know. And they were like, ah, oh, you can't say that. That's too close to this. Like that was that was really hard. I mean, you got like only so many ways you can go with music, and we had our own style. It was more and I was the, I, I kind of started influencing us more to go in another direction to become more pop where they were kind of more like an Austin sound you know and uh, uh, and I, I didn't like that I was like no we need to go off here we have a bunch of pretty boys you know what I mean and you'll see I'll put I'll put a picture here of what we look like I mean we were just like you know a bunch of really good looking guys and sometimes you get John Popper bands you know well I, like, I know that as a musician you guys are really hoping to blow up you just had the wrong timing <laughs> <You're an idiot. laughs> you know yes, yes I did ask ask me what the secret to comedy is what's the secret? timing <laughs> My son does that thing to me. He goes, something about a cat, interrupting cow or something. Oh, and yeah. Like, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Damn you. Gets me every time. So I have, I have, I have some, some attributions to make. This one, this is care of our friend Andre. 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 He, he, uh, I have. It's Andre. It's Andre. It's Andre. Well, you can call him. There's a lot of things you can call him. Only, Andre's the only one that's not bad. <laughs> But uh, so this one, this one goes out to, to him. So my wife 
is from Minnesota, as most people know, but the people online, they don't know that. So she's from Minnesota, and I'm from the other side, other side of the country. And when I relocated her down here, tomato, tomato, kidnap, relocation, whatever. But when I got her down here, I wouldn't let her she go. started she noticing that Southern boys... We just say things a little bit differently. You know, when we go to a store, we don't get out. You we guys get, play the numbers. We get down. You know, we don't put things away. We save them. Because to us, we're dramatic. Everything's dying. Save the groceries. You know. So she started picking on some of the things that I said. And one day, uh, I asked her if something was in the refrigerator. And she just kind of looked at me quizzically. You know, and I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. Because you know, she's always looking at me like I'm stupid. So like, whatever. <laughs> I say a lot of things. Well, then, shortly after that, I was asking her, hey, remember that place we went to last week with What's-Her-Face? Where did we go? And she's like, what? And I said, you know, that place. Remember, yeah, where, where was it? And, and once again, she, she was annoyed with me, but I really didn't understand why. And then, and then later that night, I had, I had, I had called someone a tard because that was insensitive. And she said, I don't understand what's up with how you talk. And I said, I don't, what do you mean? She says, you change your, your syllables. You just drop them off. Like, you say refrigerator, it's refrigerator. You say member, it's remember. You say tart, it's retard. Why do you not say, you know that's what the words are, right? Why don't you say them properly? And I just looked at her and I said, I, I don't know how to spawn to that. I had another... I had another guy. This happened recently. We were at the cigar banquet, and this guy comes up to me, and he had watched my show because he worked at 307 back when we had our show there. Yeah. And he said, dude, you were my favorite guy there. And I'm like, well, now you're my favorite guy. And he says, you used to tell this joke, this onomatopoeia joke. And I'm like, what? And then I'm like, oh, yes, that's right. I had a joke. Well, here's, here's, the, here's the joke. This, this one bears repeating. So I went to this Mexican restaurant. And I, and I ordered an onomatopoeia. And on the way to the table, the waiter dropped the tray and went, crash! And I said, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a hush over the crowd. Right? And then they're going to get right. it and they're going to be like, oh, that, that yeah. segues to the greatest compliment I ever got as a comedian. And it happened after one of my first gigs, my first headline gigs at 307. After the set, I was I was at the bar area, and this this drunk girl comes up to me, and you could tell at a bar. Yeah, yeah. Before she drunk got to me, you could tell you could tell she's hammered. She comes up to me, and she says, "Hey, you know, your jokes, if you think about them, they funny." <laughs> and I was like, That's- "You have to know the." The that, people that's kind of the idea state. you know yeah. i wanted i wanted you to have to think about it a little bit but that was that was it that was my uh my goal was always to to tickle people and then make them laugh and be like oh that was messed up i can't believe i laughed at that then and i know you so i got i got one joke just for you yeah but you know what to, to be honest and this is this is true i'm a fluffy i'm a um i'm a dick and fart jokes like I love those kind of things, and I know that they had their place. Okay, next things. week we'll bring my son on the show, and he'll tell you some choice jokes. Then <laughs> he's he'll be sprecking the your lingity all day, all day. So yeah, well, that, that's my thing. So you you're, you're you're more of the religious persuasion than I, right? Yes, of course. All right, this joke's just for you, buddy. All right, I'm gonna make this joke work, and it's the most hackneyed, cliche style of joke ever. You ready for this? Yes. Knock, knock. Who's there? Jesus. Jesus who? You're going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> That's I love I loved telling jokes to the audience. It's like, I think you just made fun of us. But they still laughed at it. That was, that was the goal. <laughs> You're going to hell. There are no gods before me. So let's change gears. Okay. We we'll change gears a little bit here. Next week, we're going to be bringing on a guest. We have a couple of options. I don't want to. I don't want to say who they are, but we we will announce them once we line it up. So stay tuned for that. Yep. But I think it's important that you know the audience come to trust us because they're t- not only taking our recommendations 
on cigars and possibly whiskey, but they'll also be taking our personal recommendations to life. We're going to be giving our opinions, and, and, and we want them to listen to our opinions and be like, that is an opinion I should aspire to have. Why? Because they smoke sexy cigars and then what they're talking about. So we have, to in, we have to earn that respect. We have to ingratiate ourselves to our viewers and listeners so that they will esteem us to the point where they will take those recommendations as gospel. So, so in order for this to happen, they must, they must bond with us. They must get to, we have to show them our vulnerabilities, John. So I know, I know, I know you're the gentleman, but right now, I need you to share with our viewing audience your most embarrassing experience with a woman right now. Oh my God. Right now. I'm not saying I'm going to do the same because they're, they're all a tie after before I got married. They're okay. every single one of them. And I'm so sorry. And I know the person who knows the story because she was on the other end of this. Um, oh, in the comments, please. Put and, yourself in the comments. Uh, I'm going to hope to God this doesn't get back to Delaware where this girl was. Oh, by the way, I did mention with a woman, not with a man. Those different episode. Yeah, that's a whole different. That's a whole. Okay, just making that sure, Make, clearing that up. Thank you. Okay, so my most embarrassing, and this is this. I mean, it, as soon as you said it, it popped right in my head. I was like, that was definitely the most embarrassing. So they tend to do that. Uh, born and raised a Catholic. Um, my girlfriend at the time, I we were both sixteen, and. Uh, story and please it's it's pretty dirty so i've never heard the story so it, i am if, i am if, enthralled if, if if you're really really don't want to hear a dirty story then just don't tune out just kind of turn it down for the next five minutes um and i'll try to go fast faster than five minutes so so my girlfriend at the time uh she said hey can i come over and and i was like yeah this is literally right after school i didn't have wrestling practice i didn't have football I was like, you know what? I am, I'm free. So yes, please come over. So my dad had this room that he did an addition onto our house. And it had like these two doors that kind of opened up in this big, huge room. And it had a big, huge fireplace. And kind of like, if you wanted to get with a girl, this was like, there was no better setting than this. You could build a fire. It was big wooden room. I mean, like think of like the nicest wood uh, all the way up. And it would go up like 30 feet in the air. And then there's these big draped out things with these fans. It was really cool. And actually my bedroom actually opened up into this room. So, um, it was, a, a it was, it was a showcase piece. It was, you know what I mean? So I took her in there and we're sitting there, we're having a great time and we're sitting there going back and forth. And, uh, at this point in like getting older teenage things, um, I never got a blowjob. So I told her, I'm like, I'm like, yeah. And I was like, dude, you know, give me a blowjob. And so I, I was a dumb kid. So I like, as soon as she was like, okay. You know what they call a blowjob in Germany? A haben sie naben. Haben sie naben. Because ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. Ja. Danke, tschüss. Aus Wiedersehen. Anyway, so listen. Uh, so I'm sitting there. I'm like, yeah. So I take my friggin' pants all the way off. And I'm sitting there with a, I'm 16. Fucking ripping hard boner. Massive calves. <laughs> no caps. <Still. laughs> so, because yeah, football season you have to gain a bunch of weight, and then wrestling season you have to drop as much as weight you can, so you can get the guys that weren't, yeah, you know. What to do. Anyway, so I'm sitting there with a big boner, and I'm sitting there, and she, we're on this big couch, and I'm sitting there, and she's going to town on me, and I'm like, oh, and. Like, there's a break between when your parents come home. You're like, I'm good for two hours, man. Hell yeah. So, and I shut the, the two doors. And just that day, my dad happens to come home super early. <laughs> ah, drink. <laughs> so, my dad sees her car in our drive. Well, this like, like, you know, it's kind of like a you thing. So, her, her thing, he's like, he goes, oh. So I guess he walked into the front door. You could, the house was so big, you couldn't hear if someone came in through the front door. Plus, there was these wooden, big, like, kind of bay doors that kind of opened up in this great room. So I'm sitting there getting slammed on, right? And <laughs> my dad was good. I guess he busted in, kind of like, oh, what you guys doing? Just joking. Because we would normally just be oh chilling, my God. hanging out. 
my dad bangs through the door and he sees his son getting a fuck. I mean, she's going to town on me and, and she's like, and she stops mid suck. <laughs> and my dad's like, he goes, Oh, Oh, like, he goes, Oh, and runs out the room. And then like Danielle, Oh my God. I said her name. I'm so sorry, Danielle. So she comes, she comes sucking my dick. She looks over, sees my dad mid gulp. And she goes, Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Welsh. <laughs> throws me back. I'm sitting there looking for my pants with big boner. I d- didn't even get a chance to nut. <laughs> and and to add this a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> my dad is like, she goes up. She literally, because she had all her clothes on. She was just like, give me a blow job or whatever. And she runs up like in my desk. Like, I'm so sorry. He's like, okay, okay. He's like this. Like, he's blocking her mouth. He's, <laughs> he's like, your okay, breath. I think you should just go. Keep your dick breath away from me. <laughs> So she runs out the house and he, you got to understand my dad. My dad was one of those guys where he was going to tell this friggin' story for the rest of his life. And he, he looks at her. So yeah, yeah, I think you should go. And then she runs out of the house. I didn't even get a chance to say goodbye or anything. And my dad kind of looks at me and does this. We're going to have a big talk after this one and shuts the big door. Big stiff talk, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> shuts the door, allows me to compose myself. And then I guess he took a second and said, hey, I had these experiences when I was growing up, so I'm going to cut him a little bit slack. He goes, you have your own bedroom for a reason. Why would you do that here? Like when I went in there and he had a conversation with me, he's like, well, why would you do that here? And number two, I'm glad you're, you, you're, it's, you know, this is somebody I've been, I'd been with her for like almost a year. And he goes, he goes, but he goes, you can't do that in front of me. You know, what if I came home and goes, go up in your room or something. He kind of did the dad talk. Like, it's all nice. good. Good job. But, you know, whatever. You know, but that is my most embarrassing chick stories. At 16, that happened to me. Wow. Wow. So now the dad. now the whole world knows that story. And I'm so sorry, Danielle. I'm so sorry. Man. I didn't your name. I, did, I wasn't going to say your name, but. Man. Every time I come to your house now, I'm not even going to knock. I'm just going to barge in and hope I find something. Just be like, ah, there we go, get John. Whatever you do, don't do that to me because I'm always having fun at the house. Oh, all right then. All right. Sometimes then. it's only by myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I was thinking about maybe sharing a story, but geez, look at the time. I think it's time to sign this bad boy off and we'll just not have to tell a story. <laughs> 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 I don't want to have to share something like that. Oh, my God. Did you have anything that bad? Um, well, I would argue worse because I didn't even have the opportunity Shut to the, have that kind you of You have exp- to tell me now. There's no way you're getting away from this. Our audience actually now needs to hear it. Yeah. Oh, you're such a jerk. No, 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 I'm not. I just told you about my, my dad margining in mid-stroke. Come on, you got to tell us. Well, oh boy. You got this. So I, I, uh, I was a late bloomer physically with the ladies um i don't believe that you know i and well it, it's not it, you didn't see it's the autism thing like socially i didn't, didn't i didn't i didn't know how to actually a lot of girls said i was cute when i was younger and it made me uncomfortable so I, I generally would like fart on them to get them to go away when they would say i was cute because i just couldn't handle that whole thing i was i was a weird kid very yeah, that's weird at, at 16 you would just fart on no 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 i'm talking about like more like at eight eight years old you know oh well yeah i, do. I wanted a girlfriend but whenever something happened i was always just like yeah shit. you know it was just like I, I did not handle it well so i was i decided i was gonna move to friend zone land and become the emperor that's what i did i emperor i was i was the the king of friend zone every every time uh, uh there was a pretty girl i was like I'm, I know how to win her over. I'm going to be just the best damn friend ever. And then she's not how you get girls. Yeah, I know that now. Thank you very much. I'm <laughs> talking about, you know, you 25 years ago. Could have used that info. Well, we but anyway, wish, I was. I wish we were friends. I, I was I was letting women totally take advantage of me. And, and, and just like, thank you, ma'am. May I have another? I, I, oh, I feel sorry. It you. was it was terrible. It was terrible. In 2002, I had this girl. This was this was arguably my worst friend zone experience ever it was this it was this girl her name was danielle too oh oh my god shut the hell up no i'm seriously her name was danielle all danielle's she, she was from delaware no, I'm just she was from delaware <laughs> <laughs> no. 
<laughs> what was her last name? <laughs> well, I can't go. I mean, I can't out her like that. So I'm, I'm not going to say her last name. But tell me off camera. <laughs> fine, I'll tell you off camera. But I really, really like this girl. And she had this like. Over Are you dead serious? Her name was Daniel? Yeah. Oh my God. I yeah. You were just okay. No, I'm serious. I mean, I would have said that had her name been something else, but no, it really was Danielle. It really was. All the Danielles in the world are like, oh my God, it wasn't me. They're like, oh my it God. It wasn't me. They just lose their hair. <laughs> so she was in, she, she had this boyfriend in like Holland or the Netherlands that, that she had this like cyber relationship with. And I, I thought she was just really, really pretty. And I didn't know how to, I didn't have game at all. So I was just all like, hey, can I hold your hair back while you're hopping in up on this other guy? That was my the that, fuck? like that was my game. I, that's how bad it was, you know. Because I thought, well, after 50 years of her doing that, she's be like, this guy cares about me. I'm gonna marry him. I was I was totally screwed up. So anyway, I met this girl, and she was all about letting me take her out on dates because her boyfriend was overseas. Yet she just I was just a friend though, and I was totally cool with it because I was an idiot. I just didn't know any better. Well, one one day, and I, I was always so nervous around her because I really, I just didn't have a, a, a ton of experience. So it, it, I was terrible. I was just terrible at talking to women. It, it's the weirdest thing. Like, I'm totally different than I am now. But we go to the Bulldog, and I order oh, the a... the Bulldog? Yeah, yeah, just, just, just down the street. I order a, a bourbon and Coke because I was trying to look sophisticated. I didn't oh, drink straight how, bourbon back then. Yeah, how old were you? I was like 23. Oh my God, you were 23. And I was lame as hell. I was super, I was like FDR, lame, really lame. But anyway, <laughs> FDR. so we're at the Bulldog and when you order a cocktail, they give you swizzle straws and you're supposed to stir like two times and then you take it out because what man drinks through a swizzle straw? You don't, yeah, you, don't. you don't, right? And I didn't either, but I have autism and I need to stem. I didn't know that's what the problem was, but that's what I, so I would fidget with the swizzle straw. And so I would play with it and then I'd put it back because it looked context appropriate because that's what you do in a bar setting. If I'd like taken out something like a, like a, like a rabbit's foot or something started stroking it, people would be like, that guy's weird. So if I'm just playing with the yeah, swizzle Lenny. straw, yeah, that'd be, that'd be fine. Exactly. So I keep the straw in the drink. That's an important fact. It's going to play a role in the story. So just, so just go ahead and Easter egg that shit right there, okay? <laughs> so we're talking, and I'm, ha I, I'm thinking, like, she's going to propose to me any second now because she's seeing how great of a guy I am. But, like, I'm totally out of no, my head. because They don't no, think that I know, I know. Thank you, John. I'm aware, okay? Mr. I went overseas with my spoon. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I have this drink, and I'm so desperately trying to look cool and, and effortless. It took a lot of effort to be so effortless. So I go take a drink but I don't look down because I'm looking at her because I'm trying to be suave and I go to take a drink and my drink is interrupted and it's interrupted by a piercing sensation of something going into my sinus cavities and my brain you inhaled the straw the straw went up my nose like hard I was just kind of like whoa I'm gonna start leaking spinal fluid out of my nose like it was so so the thing is though is like she had looked, did like a nasal tap <laughs> yeah she had looked away though so Spinal i'm looking tap. at her as i as i take a drink she looks away and so immediately i'm like oh my god and i immediately lower the glass so that by the time camera two comes back on me it's over and i'm, I'm just like cool it's fine whatever nothing happened so I pull the. Who the, put that crap there? I put the drink down. She comes and looks at me, and I look down at the drink, and there's no straw in the glass. <laughs> Is this thing on? Is this Hello. On? Hello. And so, but by this time she's looking at me. Les jeux sont faits, mon ami. It's over. Yeah. So I'm just like, hey, who wants to do some blow? I'm ready to go right here. I'm just trying to. Turn you chicken. said that to her? <laughs> I I probably peed myself. I was so embarrassed. Oh my god. It was that was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And then and then she ended up moving away with her little guy and never speaking to me again because I had she had, had her done with me. And uh I'm so sorry, man. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. But no, no, seriously. Seriously. Imagine having your dad walk in on you having massive play was a serious, serious problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. 
My dad and I had a very love-hate relationship. He loved to tell the stories about how I always put him in situations, but he hated me for doing them. The only play my parents ever walked in on me having was with Rosie Palms and her five sisters. Oh, that happened to you? <sighs> like every day. Oh. I, I did, did your mom make it dude, super they, they made my hand go on a sex offender registry because <laughs> it was molesting me. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you have to understand, when I was a kid, Michael Jackson was big and Beat It came out. <laughs> and I'm bad with directions. <laughs> Just beat it. And I was like, I learned it from watching him, okay? I learned it from watching Michael Jackson play with little boys. I am at the we end. We don't know he did that. We don't know he did that. I am at the end of my stick. It is, it is coming unwrapped, which I have to say is not something totally unexpected out of a $7 stick. But for a $7 stick, I thought... The the rapper was was a nice rapper. It was it was well done. It was it was not veiny, and the okay, ash I'm was not, good. Get and I only had to relight it towards the end when I was talking a whole lot. Let's 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 show the audience what we're talking. So you see there, the the rapper is unfurling like a scroll that is coming undone. See there you go, there you go. So I'll, I'll put that in there so you guys can. Okay, Mr. See. Simon Cowell, what rating would you give this JFR Connecticut? 83. I was going to say 82. I'd say 82 because it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not it's, bad. For, for a Connecticut? Oh, boo. Wait, 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 wait. You gave the Villager cream an 80. Yeah. You like that better? Yes. Okay. All right. For a Connecticut. Well, obviously, you know, yeah, there's an asterisk. You it's, taught we're, we're, me that you got to break them up into groups. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I, so. I'm comparing Connecticut to Connecticut here. Okay. That's fine. It's fine. So make sure everybody... We like, subscribe, and comment. Yes. We got to get 1,000 subscribers. Yes. We're going to have a guest next week, and it's yes. going to be someone you want to see. If it's the guy I'm trying to line up, you're going to want to see it. We go way back. The stories are going to be... I, 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 I think if, if it's a person you're talking about, I actually have a little history with him, too. You do. I do. You do. You I do. do. And I, and I don't I'm, think your dad walked I, in on you with him, but you no, have a little history with him. No, I do have history with him, and I'm going to bust him out for something he did to me. Oh, that... Yeah. Ooh. Oh. I'm going to do it on air. This is almost going to be like 60 minutes or like. Yeah, I hope he doesn't oh. get up and beat me up. If he does, I will weekly tell him to stop. Yeah. Just be like, stop. I'll be don't like, I'll be like ah, stop, do please. <laughs> <laughs> don't kill my co host. <laughs> <laughs> don't kill him. <laughs> so, fi any final thoughts? Uh, final thoughts are it's worth $7.50. In a heartbeat. It, it, heartbeat. It, 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 yes. It's, it's, um, it's going to have all the flavors you want uh, if you're looking for these. And it looks bougie with the pigtail cap and yeah, the little does. rice paper, parchment paper sleeve that it comes in. You, it, it, it looks like a, like, a, 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 like a boutique kind of cigar where you're like, oh, what was that? Like a you know, $12 cigar. You're like, no, dude, it's, it's a JFR. It's, yeah. it's, it's a solid smoke. So kudos to Gary for choosing that. Uh, I'm going to get to pick the next one. Noish. So I'll uh, I'll start brainstorming. I'll figure something out. You got to with the with the guest who's coming on. I mean, you know, it's got to be something good. It's got to be something so, good for him. So if you if you were to uh -huh. just make a selection right now of a cigar that you would like to 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 to, to burn next week on the show, what would you what would you want? Come to do? on, dude. You know where I'm going. A local one. A, a local stick. Something not 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 something ridiculous or illegal. Um, I'm going to tell you in the comments. I'm going to put it in the comments. Because, okay. Because I'm gonna have to. It's, it's something that's gonna take me ten minutes to come up with something. Because I've had so many great ones. So I'll put, I'm gonna put it in the comments so you guys see if that's something you want. If not, give me something you want to pick, and I might talk to him and put that one in all repertoire. And also, thing. we want to hear your embarrassing moments. We just shared ours with the world. Yes, Let us did. know what are some of your more embarrassing escapades with yes. ladies or with the men, depending on what side of the spectrum you are on. Yes. Let us know. Let's get a conversation going. Yes. And you know what? I was a gentleman when I said it, but I am the gentleman and he is. And I'm the scholar. And thank you for joining us tonight. See you for next today. time. Next time, buddy. Take care, guys.